Fed up with the everyday grind? Tired out by the dull routine? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape! Escape! Transcribed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. You are flying over the lonely wastes of the Pacific, lost, torn by the fury of a typhoon, your gas running out. And ahead of you is an adventure so strange, so terrifying, that your mind cannot accept it. Today we escape from reality with the tale of a Navy flyer who vanished from the face of the earth into a new world of the future, as Nelson Bond told it in his story, Conqueror's Isle. You've got to believe this. It sounds utterly impossible, I know. It sounds... it sounds crazy. That's why I'm here, sir. But it's the truth, and you've got to believe it. You've got to, sir. You've got That's to. the way he started, almost as soon as I'd walked into his hospital room. He wasn't violent, you understand. There was no need for restraint. But his every action, every gesture was evidence of a psychotic condition. To be extremely charitable, battle fatigue. Well, anyway, it was an odd case. I was already acquainted, of course, with the history... Young man, graduate of, of Annapolis, lieutenant in the fleet air arm, excellent record, citations for bravery and so forth. And toward the end of the war, he and his bomber crew disappeared over the South China Sea. Search failed to turn them up. They were, of course, presumed to be lost. And then a month ago, almost four years later, Lieutenant Brady was found by a Brazilian freighter drifting helplessly and nearly dead in a tiny life raft from the airplane. Curiously enough, his position was not far from that last reported by his radio operator four years ago. But when he was asked where he'd been, he gave a story so fantastic, so utterly it's unbelievable... The truth, and you've got to believe it. You've got to, sir. At ease, Lieutenant. I'm sorry, sir. I'm here to consult with you as a physician, not order your cure as a superior officer. Now, suppose we ignore the braid while you tell me about it. Oh, <laughs> well, thank you, Doctor. Where should I begin? Well, it's your story. You know what it is you want me to believe. The trouble began, I understand, on your last bombing mission. Yes, that's right. That's where my troubles began. The thing's been going on for much longer than that. Years, certainly. Decades, perhaps. Somebody has got to do something, Doctor. Time is racing by, and with every passing day, they grow stronger. I've got to make people understand. Lieutenant. Now, suppose you start at the beginning with that unfortunate last flight. Yes, sir. I, I'm sorry I got a little... Well, then it, it was this way. We'd finished our mission and we were starting for home. We were over the South China Sea between the Philippines and Indochina, roughly off Palawan. And everything was peaches and cream. The Arden Alice was purring along like a dream and I was sitting there chewing up a pack of Lifesavers, thinking how good that can of cold beer was going to taste when the intercom crackled in my ear. Lieutenant Jep Freighter, 10 o'clock. Huh? Yeah, you're right. Looks like a single tramp beating up the coast. You still got a Bertha? Yes, sir. Okay, maybe we can have some fun. Red 4 to Mac. Red 4 to Mac. Go ahead, Red 4. Jap Freighter, 10 o'clock. Check. We've still got a Bertha. How about it? Why not? It's your party. Go ahead and good luck. Roger and out. It was as easy as hitting a sitting duck. The long dive, the bomb release, the pull-out, the dull concussion. We laid it down her aft stack, and that Jap ship went up like a Roman candle. Hey, hey, nice going, Lieutenant. Right on the button. That's one Jap we won't have to worry about anymore. Lieutenant, we're hit. Huh? A piece of that Jap must have come up and hit us. We're spraying gas all over the Pacific out of the left-wing tank. Yeah, I see it now. Well, guys, get ready for a bath. We'll never make it back. I object. It ain't Saturday night. Never mind. I always did want to take a ride on one of them little rubber boats. No need to worry. The Navy takes care of its own. They'll be out to get us before we have a chance to get thirsty. Red 4 to Mac. Red 4 to Mac. Nice going, fella. Yeah. Only it was a two-way deal. We're hit, Mac. Losing gas fast. Think you can make it? Nope. It's a salt bath for us. 
Sorry, fellas. Keep your radio on. Give your last position to base before you ditch it. They'll have a rescue party out in an hour. Well, Cope. See you tonight. Good luck. Over. Roger out. You see, there was nothing to it. Happened every day. With ships all over the Pacific, they'd have a destroyer sitting there when we came down. But a half hour later, when our gas was down to a few cupfuls and the rest of the squadron was long out of sight, an amazing thing happened. One minute the sky was clear and cloudless, the next minute we were surrounded by thunderheads and a typhoon burst on us. Holy cow, Lieutenant, where'd this come from? I don't know, but it's a Lulu. Fasten your safety belts, there's no telling what this'll do to us. It was a granddaddy typhoon, all right, but it lasted only a few minutes. Then we got out of it as miraculously as we'd come into it. And wonder of wonders, we were directly over a small island. Well, what do you know? Take a look at that sight for sore eyes. Man, oh man, it looks mighty fine to me. Uh, what island is it, Lieutenant? I don't know. I don't recognize it. And after the way we got tossed around back there, I haven't any idea of our position. We could be anywhere from the coast of China to the Philippines. Who knows? Who cares? It's dry land. Yeah, just in time. We're out of gas. Hey, Jack. Yeah? See if you can get a fix and radio our position. We're going down. We landed safely on a little strip of sandy beach. And only after we'd climbed out of the plane did we begin to have any misgivings. What do you think, Skipper? Well, it doesn't look like much, but... I don't see anybody. Not a sign of life. I got a good look from topside coming down. There weren't any houses, nothing. And still, you can't tell. It could be Japs. Or worse. Headhunters, maybe. We better stick together, stay close to the plane. Shouldn't be more than a few hours. Oh, Hello. yeah, except... Hey, what the... Hold it. Hello there. Uh, a white man. Hey, what oh, is brother. this? Keep your eyes open. It might be a trap. But he's a white man. He speaks English and he's not armed. No, I don't see any guns. Just the same. Watch it. Welcome, gentlemen. Welcome. We saw you land, so I hurried out to see if I could be of any assistance. Uh, may I introduce myself? I'm Dr. Grove. I'm Lieutenant Brady, and these are my men. Radio man Kavanaugh... My gunner, Sergeant Geller. Hi, Hi It's Dr. pleasure, Hello. gentlemen, pleasure. Are any of you in need of medical assistance? No, thanks. We're all okay. Just a little surprised to find anyone here. Well, yes, of course. Uh, that can be explained to you later. But uh, right now, you'll be wanting food and rest. Hey, now, a little chow wouldn't be bad. But first, <laughs> we, we have to get in touch with our base. Give them our position. Oh, of course. But uh, such things take some time in these primitive areas. Oh, we have a radio on the plane. Did have, Skipper. Well, I was uh, just starting to tell you. It went out just before we sighted the island. Must have got wanged up in that storm. Well, can you fix it? Well, I suppose so, if it's nothing serious. I'll uh, tell you better after I have a chance to look at it. Of course. But in the meantime, I hope you'll accept our humble hospitality. We don't have the pleasure of entertaining new guests here often. It'll be good to chat with you all. Uh, if you'll follow me, please. How about it, Skipper? Sure. Why not? After the last half hour, we could all use a little relaxation. Very good. Uh, right this way, please. I should have smelled it right then. There was something strange about the whole thing. There were a lot of questions in my mind, but somehow I didn't ask them. Instead, we walked down the jungle path behind Dr. Grove like lambs to the slaughter. Tom Geller must have had the same misgivings because he whispered in my ear. I don't get it, Skipper. Don't get what, Tom? Where do these guys come from? Where do they hang out? When we were coming in, I made sure to take a good look at this island. There were no houses, no nothing. I don't know. I guess we'll find out soon enough. Yeah. Hey, stop it. Ho Holy cow, will you look at that? Dr. Grove stopped in front of what looked like a big rock. And then we saw it was expertly camouflaged cement with a sliding door. There. Here we are, gentlemen. If you'll be good enough to enter. Enter what? That? <laughs> Don't be alarmed. It's only an elevator. An elevator? In this jungle? Now, what kind of monkey business is this, anyhow? Do you mean to tell me you live underground? My dear lieutenant, I'll be glad to explain everything later. It's all very simple. But uh, first, I must insist that you oh, enter the shaft. Oh, so now you're insisting. Oh. And suppose we prefer not to step into your elevator. Then what? Then I should be compelled, uh, most regretfully, to enforce my request. Guess again, pal. We happen to be armed. A gun. Three guns. See, that's one detail you overlooked. I overlooked no details, Lieutenant. 
Uh, would you be kind enough to fire your gun? Watch yourself, Skip. It's a trick. He wants you to shoot. The sound will bring help. Wrong, my friend. I need no help. Very well. If you won't accept my invitation... Wait a minute. Keep your hand out of your pocket. Perhaps you would care to stop me, Lieutenant? Okay, if you asked for it. What the hey, hell? Lieutenant! <laughs> Try again, Lieutenant, but your gun will not work Skip on this island. right. Mine will work mine. either. And now... Perhaps you'll be kind enough to step into the shaft? Look, I don't know what's going on here, but I don't want any part of it. Yeah, neither do I. Come, Come on, on, gang. Let's get out of here. Just you a minute. It. I'm sorry. You forced me to use harsh measures. Uh, believe me, I do so reluctantly. What's that you've got there? Just a small tube, but a very potent weapon, I must warn you. Yeah? Well, then you better use it fast. I made a desperate lunge for him, and suddenly... A tiny shaft of light flicked out from the tube and touched me. And I stopped, frozen in my tracks, conscious, my eyes open, seeing him, hearing him. But try as I would, I could not move a muscle. I was as if turned to stone. In just a moment, we will return to escape. But first, both Gangbusters and The Adventures of Philip Marlowe are regular Saturday night features on most of these same CBS network stations. So be listening tonight when they bring you an exceptional, fast-moving, gripping hour of mystery. And now with our stars, David Ellis, Ted Von Eltz, and Bill Johnstone, we return to the second act of Escape and Conqueror's Isle. was paralyzed, Dr. Gorham. Completely paralyzed, as if turned to stone. I had all my senses. I could could see and hear and feel, but I couldn't move a muscle, not even turn my eyes. And you say this happened because of some kind of light beam? Well, not exactly a beam, sir. Perhaps not exactly light. Just a kind of... kind of radiance. A gas, perhaps? No, because it had no form, no odor, no taste. It was like becoming enmeshed in a web of moonbeams. I see. And its only effect on you was to immobilize you. Yes, that's right. It didn't burn or sting or cause pain in any way. I simply couldn't move. It was like a hypnotic trance. And then? Well, then some of Dr. Grove's companions came out of the elevator. They picked us up and carried us. I could feel their hands very softly, as if they were far away from my body, as if there were layers of rubber between them and me. And I could hear Dr. Grove talking. Place him in the shaft. Gently, please. I could see him bending over me into my line of vision. I'm sorry, Lieutenant. I sincerely regret having to inconvenience you. But, you see, just as we have the means of hampering your primitive mechanical devices, your guns, your radio, so do we have the means to enforce our requests. Requests which are, I assure you, only reasonable and necessary under the circumstances. Very well. Take us down. My head was reeling, and fear was growing in me. Who were these men to talk of radio as a primitive device? What kind of men were they? Where were they taking the three of us, and what were they going to do with us? As if he'd read my thoughts, Dr. Grove leaned over me again. There's no need to be alarmed, Lieutenant. No need at all. All right. Gently. Carry them gently. Well, Fraser... I'm sorry, Freighter Dorden. It was necessary. They would not come willingly. I see. A few of them do. I'll put them in the sleeping chambers until they recover. And be gentle. They are so frightened. Poor things. Poor things. Poor things, he'd said. Not as if we were human beings at all but animals, some weak, dumb animals with whom they must be gentle. It was then that I began to know real fear. We were in a great underground city, but I could see little of it, nothing except what passed in front of my rigid eyes. Then I was carried into a room, deposited upon a soft couch, and left alone. I could not close my eyes, but gradually the light began to fade, to melt away. I was in deep blackness 
and I slipped. I don't know whether the return of the light awakened me or whether it came on automatically when I woke up, but the room was bright and I could move again. I jumped up, tried the door, but of course it was locked and there was no other way of escape. The room was a small cell with metal walls and ceiling, a kind of metal I'd never seen before. There was a cot, a desk and a chair and nothing else. But the really amazing thing was the light. I searched the entire room carefully, but there were no fixtures, no indirect lighting arrangements. The light came out of the walls, evenly filling the room, casting no shadows. Suddenly, I wanted to see Kavanaugh and Geller. I yelled, I yelled at the top of my lungs. But there was almost no sound, no echo from the walls. They simply absorbed the sound into utter silence. Then as I stood there, with fear cold in my stomach. I heard a faint sound, a footstep behind me. I whirled around just in time to see Dr. Grove stepping through the wall. You were... Uh, you said through the wall, Lieutenant. Of course, you mean through the door. Through the wall. Through the wall, sir. The door was in front of me. But Dr. Grove stepped into my cell through the solid metal wall. You realize that what you're saying is impossible. To us it is. To them nothing is impossible. Nothing. That's why we must act and act now before it's too late. You must believe me, sir. This is man's last chance. I'll do my best. Uh, perhaps you'd better continue. Now, uh, this Dr. Grove stepped through the wall. Yes. As I'll tell the, the rest as quickly as I can, I can see that you don't believe me. But someone must, somewhere, sometime, someone must. Lieutenant. Well, as I said, Dr. Grove stepped into my cell through the wall. Suddenly, my panic ended. I looked at him now with awe. And we talked, not as man to man, but as man to a lesser creature. Me. You must not be frightened, Lieutenant. You do not understand how I pass through a wall which to you seems solid. And not understanding, you feared. But I... Yet there is nothing supernatural or fearful about what I did. Any of us can do it at will. You see, there is no such thing as a solid in this world of relativity. We know that there is plenty of room for the molecules of our bodies to pass between the molecules of those walls. We oh. simply make a necessary mental adjustment and walk where we will. It is an ability as basic to us as breathing to a person like you. What kind of men are you? You have been educated, uh, studied Darwin, you know the facts of evolution. You know how man has progressed through various stages from the primitive savagery of the Neanderthal man. Well, yes, Obviously, but... this process can and will continue. To suppose that the evolution of man is complete with you is a mistake of conceit. You mean you are the next stage? Exactly. You have heard of the process of mutation, perhaps. How suddenly a white rose is produced of a family of red roses, and from then on produces only white descendants? Yes. So have we been evolved as mutants, infinitely superior to our parents and our fellow men, knowing by instinct right from birth what you must study years to learn, your most difficult physics and mathematics, our ABCs, our studies far beyond your understanding. Are there... Many of you? Yes. You see, the process has been going on for many years. Hundreds, thousands more come to us every year from all over the world, drawn here by telepathic message, where we have isolation to study, learn, build, prepare ourselves. Prepare? Prepare for what? For the task ahead. Obviously, when we are ready, when we are numerous enough to fill all the necessary positions, our superior intelligence must shape a new world. Take over the world. Obviously. And you will destroy man? How little you understand us. Do you destroy the animals of the field because they are not your intellectual peers? Our obligation is to keep and protect you, to act as your friendly guardians in a world which will be strange to you and, and, and frightening, as my walking through the wall was frightening to you. I see. Yes, I see. Then what is your plan? Rather say, 
nature's plan. And the answer to that lies in history. What became of the anthropoids, the cavemen? They died out. Civilization passed them by. They fell before the onrush of higher forms of life. Even so. Even so. But uh, I give you our pledge that we will be kind. We will be kind. And then he took me out into that great underground city, through its corridors and great halls and laboratories and shops, took me among the thousands of his fellow men. There I saw marvels of which I could talk for hours. There were... But they would be beyond your comprehension as they were beyond mine. You wouldn't believe me, and so I won't bother to tell you. Then I met others like us, some 200 captive cattle, people who had stumbled onto this island as I had. There were famous names among them. A famous author whose ship disappeared in the Pacific years ago. A big game hunter. A famous aviatrix for whom a dozen fleets had sought in vain. All of us, prisoners. We were treated with great kindness, made comfortable, relatively happy. We were their pets, you see. Their dumb animal pets. For over three years, I stayed there. After a while, I ceased to struggle, even in my mind. I was defeated. And so I succumbed to the peaceful, bucolic existence that was my fate. At least, at least that's what I thought. Then came that last day. Dr. Grove had made me his special pet. I was allowed to follow him about it at work, to talk to him at length. And on this day, he confided in me even more than usual. Well, Lieutenant, it has been a pleasant day. Yes, Doctor. Am I to go now? Not for a moment. Ah, yes, I shall miss having you with me when I'm gone. Gone? You're going away, sir? Yes, very soon. But where? Out. Out into the world where you once lived. But why? Oh, there are many, very many of us there already. In strategic places, of course. An important politician here, an industrial magnet there, a famous author whose words are gospel to his readers. I will have my place, an important one. But I didn't know. You didn't tell me that it's already begun. Oh, yes, definitely. The hour is close at hand. And then, all of us, the whole world. Lieutenant. You know us now. You know that we will be kind. Kind. Yes, kind. Suddenly all the anger that was in me welled up. I didn't want to be a dumb animal, a pet for some superior being to be kind to. I didn't want that for my loved ones, my friends, my fellow men. That night at dinner when they fed the prisoners in a big communal hall, I got a chance to talk to Kavanaugh, my old radio man. He listened and then shrugged hopelessly. They'll succeed, Joe. You know that. No. Not if the world could be warned. I don't know. Maybe it wouldn't make any difference. Besides, how could they be warned? If somebody could get away from here. Escape? Oh, that's impossible. I know, that's what I thought. But listen, I've got an idea. There's one chink in their invincibility. What? Their gentleness, their kindness. They can't bear to hurt anyone. None of their weapons kill, but only, only paralyze temporarily. And they simply cannot conceive of treachery. What are you driving at? This. I'm going to play on Dr. Grove's liking for me, his kindness. And I'm going to trick him. How? Tomorrow I'll ask him to take me up above, back to the plane, to... to get pictures of my father and sister. Tell him I'm lonesome, suffering. He'll do it. I'm sure he will. It's very kind of you, Dr. Grove, to do this for me. Oh, not at all, Lieutenant. I understand your feeling. With you leaving, I'd have no one, no one close. The pictures will make me feel a lot better. Well, I only hope they're still here. The plane is partially demolished by the weather, as you can see. Oh, they'll be there. They were in the map compartment. They'd be out of the weather. Well, 
Here we are. Dr. And... Grove, look, uh, over there. Where are oh. Sorry, Doctor. But I had to do it. I hope I didn't kill him. He had been kind, but I hit him hard. Then I broke out a life raft from the rotting plane. I was almost afraid to look at it, but it was okay, even complete with supplies, four years old. I ripped the valve and threw it into the water. In five minutes, I was out beyond the breakers. I don't know how many days or weeks it was before they picked me up, but it was a long time. And I was more dead than alive. Yes, yes, Lieutenant, you were in bad shape. It was a horrible experience. But you see, it doesn't matter about me. It's the others that... You don't believe me either, do you? Well, Lieutenant, it's, it's been a pleasure to listen to your story. I, I'll make a report to my superiors. Please be patient and try not to worry. Hmm. Try not to worry. Good day, Lieutenant. Get out. Get out, sir. Oh, there, Commander Gorham. You've talked to him? What's the verdict? A clear case of persecution mania. An amazing form. I've never heard a tale more complete and logical, yes, but I... Yes, I know what you mean. Well, do what you can for him. I'm afraid he's going to be here for a long time. Perhaps for as long as he lives. Turned loose, he might be dangerous. Yeah, that's too bad. Nice boy, too. But floating for four weeks on a life raft, and heaven knows what before that, it sure does things to a man. Well, Doctor... How about lunch? No, no, thanks. I've got to run along. I have to turn in my report and recommendation on this case. Oh, of course. Well, I'll see you later. I watched the man disappear down the hall. I stood there for a moment lost in thought, seeing the face of that boy in there. It was hard to know how best to be kind to a boy like that, but I roused myself. I had much to do. So much. And if I went down through the lobby of the hospital, some fool would surely delay me and get me into a long-winded discussion, and I didn't feel a bit like talking. I wanted to get out of this place and forward my report, my report that this Brady case was closed, that there'd be no more trouble from this source. My car was just outside on the street. There was no one in sight in the corridor. So I turned and... quietly walked through the wall... Escape is produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Today we have presented transcribed Conqueror's Isle by Nelson Bond, adapted for radio by John Dunkel. Starred as Lieutenant Brady was David Ellis, as Dr. Gorham, Ted Von Eltz, as Dr. Grove, Bill Johnstone. Featured players were Sam Edwards and Dick Benedict. The special music was arranged and played by Ivan Dittmars. <laughs> Be sure and be with us again next week at the same time when we will bring you another great story of mystery and intrigue by one of the world's outstanding authors of high adventure as CBS again presents Escape. Ronnie and Benita are two names that are as familiar to Jack Benny fans as Mary, Phil, Rochester, Dennis, and Don. And since Jack Benny has received thousands of letters asking that the Ronald Coleman's be brought back soon, he's happy to present them as special guests on his program this Sunday. Hear the Jack Benny program on these same CBS stations tomorrow night. This is Roy Rowan speaking for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>